Konnichiwa. Uh, my name is David Ingram from the School of Ed Engineering at the University of Edinburgh and I'm going to talk uh, about engineering doctoral training in partnership with industry and in particular I'm going to talk about the industrial CDT in offshore renewable energy or ID Corps. This is a joint program between the University of Ed Edinburgh, the University of Exeter, the University of Strathclyde and the Scottish Association for Marine Sciences. And we're very grateful for funding to the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and the Natural Environment Research Council from UKRI. I will briefly introduce what ID Corps is and then I'll talk about what is an engineering doctorate and then I'll talk about the student training program and the research phase and how we work in partnership with companies and with the other academic partners and then we'll look at some conclusions. So ID Corps is one of 75 EPSRC funded centres for doctoral training. Um, we were originally funded in 2011 by the Energy Technologies Institute and the EPSRC under a separate programme but we bid in 2018 to take part in the EPSRC's national refunding program and were very fortunate to be refunded in, in that program and we're one of only a handful of centres which is jointly funded by EPSRC and NERC. Uh, our funding uh, is about £6 million will fund the training of 50 students in five cohorts and EPSRC and NERC are covering two-thirds of the cost of training those students while industry provides the remaining third. And this infographic talks about the uh, national program. So nationally, there are 75 centres that have been funded, uh, in total training 4,500, just over 4,500 doctoral students, um, based in 48 universities, and with an investment of about 450 million from UKRI, and a further 500 million from, from industry. We're also an award-winning centre. Uh, last year we won the Scottish Green Energy Award for the contribution to skills for the centre as a whole and one of our students won both the Young and Inspiring Award and the Young Professionals Award and we're very very proud uh, not only of winning the contribution to skills award but that our students are so highly thought of by the Scottish renewable energy sector. So the programme is itself, ID Corps, is a jointly awarded degree from the Universities of Edinburgh, Exeter and Strathclyde and we deliver it in partnership also, as I've said, with the Scottish Association for Marine Sciences. Many of our training courses are, are run completely jointly so there will be lecturers from the three universities uh, all delivering courses in the same, in the same subject area and, uh, uh, and we use the Scottish Association for Marine Sciences to deliver the marine biology training uh, for our students and also to look at societal aspects. We recruit students from a very broad range of science and technology and engineering and mathematics backgrounds so we don't rely necessarily on students having a prior experience in, in offshore renewable energy of any kind at all and many of our best students have come from non-traditional backgrounds. We've had a truly excellent graduate who started off joined us as a marine biologist and marine ecologist and turned out to have a, a natural talent for high voltage electrical power engineering which I think came as big a surprise to her as it was to us. Uh, we also take students both from industry and academia though all of our students are sponsored by the programme and are not employees uh, from industrial companies though it would be possible to set up a scheme where students were employed. So what is an engineering doctorate? Well it's a four year programme. This is different to the normal three year programme for a PhD in the, in, in the UK. And the programme has 180 credits of integrated training. That's 1,800 hours of training or a whole year. So the extra year, the difference between the three years and the four years, is a year of formal training that's assessed and, uh, and delivered by the universities. And our students do their three year industry based research project based in the industrial companies. So they're not working in a university research lab, they're working in a corporate investment industrial environment. And the projects are driven by the, the need uh, of, of the sponsor companies rather than the curiosity of the students. And many of our projects as a consequence have delivered significant impact. 
We've had projects which have saved over £10 million for the sponsor company or developed tools which have been uh, revolutionised the, the business practice of, of the sponsor company. And we're very proud of, of that level of impact. Our students go through a process as they come through the, the programme and this slide illustrates the life cycle of a cohort of students. So for those 10 students that we're training each year, we receive about 100 online applications and we undertake a quality sift to make sure that students who are of a suitable standard are interviewed. And we will interview about 40 students for the 10 places. Those interviews are conducted by a panel of academics, one from each of the three universities and, and this is very important to us, a representative from one of the industrial companies that sponsor our students. They might not be a sponsor for student projects in the coming um, period, so for the students they're interviewing, but, but they will have experience of, of working with ID Corps. And that's very important because the industrial perspective in these interviews is, is very, very important to making sure that the right students join the programme. And in recent years, we've been very proud to have some of the alumni from the programme who are now working in industry sitting on the interview panel. The students then undertake two semesters worth of taught courses and in the middle of that we allocate projects to, to the students so they don't know when they join us what area their research project is going to be in and during the first semester and during the application process we're recruiting sponsor companies. After the second semester the students start their industrial research projects and they start with an initial project planning phase followed by a project review followed by annual reviews with research in between and ending with the, the VIVA examination. Throughout this time they undertake responsible research and innovation uh, assessments of their, of their programmes and RRI is a, is a thing which the, the research councils have insisted is, is run in all of the CDTs but we have taken it very much to heart in ID Corps and our students are trained in that right at the very beginning of the programme and we expect them all the way through to look at the consequences and the impact of their work and to understand how maybe the work direction needs to be changed slightly to give a, a more ethical approach or a more responsible outcome from the work that they're undertaking. So I'm going to talk about the courses that the students take and the training program that we've developed. But before I do uh, talk about courses specifically, I want to talk a little bit about the broad uh, background to the training program. So we designed the program with training. Uh, so we designed the training program with advice from industry. We have uh, an industrial advisory board who keep us up to date with the needs of the sector and uh, advise us on what's working well and what's not working well from our, our training program. And then sometimes industry also help us deliver. The, the training program uh, and our training program is based around problem-based learning. We really believe in problem-based learning and we want to try and get the students to be challenged all the time and to have an opportunity to develop. And all of the courses that students will take are at a master's or doctoral level so they're never, they're never exposed to undergraduate type material and indeed most of the material that they're exposed to is specifically at doctoral level. So problem-based learning is, a, is an approach which was originally developed for training medical students. It's well known to foster student-centred learning and, and uphold lifelong learning and stresses the comprehension of an understanding rather than facts. It's very important to us that our graduates are people who have the flexibility to learn new things as they go along because they're going to be working in a rapidly changing sector. And we don't want them to rely on facts which we've taught them throughout their training and not to have the flexibility to, to solve the problems in the world tomorrow that we couldn't foresee at the time that we put the training program together. It also helps self-motivation in the students and it's very, very positive between us and the students and really, really uh, helps them develop as a team and develop team working skills. This is our training program. It's a cartoon that we put together to illustrate the program when we put the, the scheme together originally. So we start with an introductionary unit uh, just to familiarise students with the background to what they're going to be learning. 
to welcome them to the program and importantly to introduce the group design project which runs as a thread all the way through the first year of the training program. We then have uh, uh, an introductory unit that, that builds on people's engineering skills to the level we require and we look at research skills, at resource assessment, the electrical machines, offshore structures, uh, we do some work on the group design project, we look at materials and structures, we teach the students about project economics and this is a course that also looks at macroeconomics and it's taught by a team of economists from the internationally renowned Fraser and Valander Institute at Strathclyde University. We teach them about the electrical power network and energy networks, we do some more research skills and then we have the, the final capstone of the group design project. And after that, there is some cohort building activities and the first year ends with a course on marine biology taught at the Scottish Association for Marine Sciences. Then the students start their research projects and through years two, three and four in this diagram, the grey part is the research project running. During those times, during the second and third years, the students undertake some training uh, and do six more courses. They do a course on business skills and entrepreneurial uh, industries which is uh, delivered by the University of Edinburgh Business School. We look at how energy goes from the ocean to the end user particularly in islanded communities and we we use Orkney as a case study for that and look at the hydrogen economy in Orkney. We look at marine energy and societies and consenting. We look at robotics and robotic inspection and sensors um, that's something that we were asked to put into the program by the sector because it's becoming more and more important. And we look at certification, classification societies, how you get programs consented and insured and delivered in a, in a way which is, is safe and secure for the sector. Uh, and finally, we look at environmental engineering, and we look at moorings and foundations and how you work in an environment in a sensitive way. In the final year, there aren't formally assessed training courses, but the students will all receive training in how to write a thesis and in how to prepare for the VIVA examination. Each of the 10 credit courses is delivered in a two-week block, including the assessment. So the students are doing 100 hours work in a two-week block. That's a huge amount. So we guarantee that for the weekends in between, we won't ask them to do anything. Our courses are taught by a combination of staff from across the ID Core partners. So, for example, in the energy uh, resource module that the students are taking at the moment, they will be taught by staff from Exeter University who will be talking about wave energy resource. They'll be taught by staff from Edinburgh University who will be talking about tidal energy resource and tidal energy measurements. And they'll be taught by staff from Strathclyde University who will be talking about wind energy measurement and wind energy resource. And that's typical of many of the courses that our students will undertake. All of our courses are assessed on a pass-fail basis and we do not record percentage marks. And this is very, very important to us. We want to change in behaviour of students. If we award percentage marks and we award grade point averages, then the student's behaviour is going to be that which they had at their undergraduate and master's level programmes where they concentrate on things that they are already good at because they can maximise their mark in those subjects and they will do enough in the other subjects to get by. We want them to concentrate on the things that they are weak at and to develop skills in areas where they feel uncomfortable and to help their peers in things which they are comfortable with and, and will improve their learning in that way. And that can only be done by removing that incentive of I'm going to maximise the grade point average. And so we don't record percentage marks and we examine students on a pass-fail basis only. Typically our courses will start with fundamental knowledge and often this is peer supported. So students that have an understanding of that area, have a background in naval architecture for example, or in mechanical or electrical engineering, will help teach their colleagues. Lecturers and experts in the subject will stretch that and provide deeper learning and then industry examples will be used to provide real world applications and finally uh, there will be some kind of assessment often based on real world problems sometimes involving group work and all of that happens in the two weeks that the course proceeds for. So if we talk about some of the courses in detail 
Engineering Foundations is a, is a fundamental course that we have to provide. Our students come from a range of different backgrounds. As I've already said, we have students with backgrounds in marine biology. Uh, we've had students with backgrounds in chemistry, in electrical engineering, in mechanical, civil, naval architecture, aeronautical engineering, uh, students with backgrounds in, in um, geology and geotechnics. And so we need to train them in all the different kinds of engineering that they don't have. So we build their background in electrical, mechanical, civil engineering. At the end of the two week course, they sit an exam in that subject. We sit them final year exam questions from, from, from degree papers that will be sat by our final year students. And we do that as a takeaway exam. So the students have 24 hours to answer the questions. They can look things up on the internet. They can look things up in the library. They can't talk to anybody else about the questions. So they can't get the advice of an expert. Uh, but they're practicing in a, a, and acting in a way that, uh, a, that a graduate engineer working in industry would work. Nobody asks someone to go away and design a robot and locks them in an office and says, you're not allowed to consult any external material for three hours until you have the answer. But that's how we examine students. So we've chosen not to do that. And again, it reinforces the idea that ID Corps is not the same as their undergraduate education. We teach them research skills. We teach them how to manage information. We teach them how to read the scientific literature. We teach them how to understand uncertainty and to, and to use statistical techniques and quantitative methods. And we teach them to program in Python. And we do all of that in the first part of the course. Those are all important skills which they will use during the other taught units but will and will build on as they go into their research projects. And at the end, we teach them a course on hydrodynamic model testing and they go to the Kelvin Hydrodynamics Laboratory in Strathclyde and they learn how you do model test experiments as an opportunity to put some of the skills that they've learned into practice and also to, to give them a firm foundation in experimental work. And that's the research skills course. Our group design project is a capstone to that first year in training and it's proposed to the students right at the very beginning of the project. So at the start of the course, in that first introductory week, then a group from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult will come in and will tell the students that their task for the remainder of the year is to come up with the front-end engineering design for a floating offshore wind farm to be constructed off the coast of Blythe, next to a demonstration wind farm that was built by EDF, um, as part of a test site operated by the ORE catapult. They have to, through the year, they have to plan and conduct the resource assessment. We will give them the resource data to analyse. They have to look at the performance of the machines that they've chosen, estimate levelised cost of energy, net present value, energy and carbon payback periods, and make recommendations to the project developer. And at the end of the project, they're presenting a front-end engineering design for the project that they have come up with to, to the developer. But we're even, even more flexibility than that is demanded because the day after they submit their front-end engineering design uh, to the, to the, to, for assessment, uh, we put them in front of a Dragon's Den panel and they have, to, they have to seek the funding for their project. And we have some friends and, uh, from industry who come and join us who have made real investment decisions and they ask the students the kind of questions that the dragons ask in, in the Dragon's Den TV program uh, and they really put them on the spot and they're asking questions that are completely different from the engineering questions that they were answering the day before in their front end re engineering report and this really helps develop flexibility in the students and their ability to talk to a range of audience and, and I think it's probably one of the things that I'm proudest of in the first year. When we send them to Oban, they go out with marine biologists into the real environment. They are looking at the coastal and marine environments, at key biology habit uh, species, and looking at habitats. Uh, these are photographs. This is a photograph of, that was taken by the students when they were looking at phototagging dolphins. They look at vulnerabilities of interaction and the cost of data collection. And it's a real marine biology course taught by real marine biologists. And, and the marine biologists love getting hold of the engineering students. And our students really look forward to going to Oban 
and, and experiencing the, the marine environment in this way. They also do a course on marine renewable and society where they learn about marine spatial planning and the competition for the marine real estate and they learn about the processes that need to be gone through for environmental impact assessments and consenting. Uh, this is very onerous in the UK and, and quite, quite difficult but it's very important that an engineer developing a project or developing a new technology understands what's needed for that impact and consenting processes and they also learn how to engage with marine users and uh, and fishing communities and again that's very very important um, it, it, it's critical and one of the examples we use is the example from from um, from Nagasaki of the fishing communities from go to city who went to Orkney to meet the Orkney fishermen to learn about what marine energy had done for the island community in Orkney and what a change that made so it's very important that we that we give that information and background to our students. We undertake cohort building activities so we take the students to the university centre uh, in the highlands and we get them doing outdoor activities and walking up mountains and and doing things like that uh, and sometimes the students have other skills so this is a picture which shows some face painting that went on. One of our students uh, has, was quite skilled at, at painting people's faces and painted up all of the students in her cohort when they went to Furbush, including Ajit, who is now a lecturer at Exeter University, but was so proud of being on ID Corps that he had the logo painted on his forehead. So if we think about the projects, the projects are agreed between the sponsoring companies and the centre, and part of my role as the academic director and the role of the supervisors is to ensure that the students work is going to meet the standards needed for an award. We've never had to say to a company that's too difficult a project, that's too challenging, uh, but we have had to say to a company that's too big a project and maybe it's two projects and equally I've never had to say to a company that's too easy, it's too simple, can we please make it harder companies really understand what's needed for an NHD project, what excites students and what challenges them and and we predominantly get very high quality uh, applications from companies the first time round. We set up a non-disclosure agreement between the centre, the students and the sponsoring company and we have to do that because our students are not employees of the companies. So these are some of the project sponsors and when you look at this list you see a wide range of companies ranging from E.ON, Scottish Power and EDF who are very large blue chip companies through to certification agencies like DNV and Lloyd's Register uh, and uh, then uh, consulting companies like Exodus and uh, Black and & Veatch um, and then finally there are organisations like the Catapult and who are, who are test centers uh, and Flowwave and EMEC uh, and then there are companies like Nova Innovation, Palamis Wave Power, Orbital Marine Power, Sustainable Marine Energy, Core Power and Motion Energy who are technology developers. Some of these are very small companies, some of these are very fragile companies. Palamis Wave Power failed um, due, to, due to commercial problems and we had students working with them who were sponsored by them at the time of the company failure. The fact that our students are not employed by the company and are sponsored and that it's an engineering doctorate allows us to deal with that situation. So those students were stranded, they had no project to carry on with, so we were able to reallocate them to new sponsor companies and engineering doctoral students can work on a portfolio of linked projects, so we were able to support the students in that way. A couple of the students were almost finished their projects, so we moved them into the university and gave them the opportunity to, to finish the project in a, in a university environment. And everybody completed successfully and nobody was damaged by the collapse of the company. However, all of the students that were working there saw exactly what happened when a company collapses, exactly what led the company to fail and will be much better engineers as a result of that experience. Our students projects can be anywhere in the UK and we have some projects with international sponsors so we sometimes have students working in Paris and we've got students who will be visiting Denmark shortly because their sponsor company is based in Denmark. But other than that in the UK we have students in the far north in Orkney, uh, we have students in the far southwest 
uh, down down in, in Falmouth and Camborne. The students choose when the projects are presented. They choose four projects that they'd like to apply for. Companies then interview those applicants. And after the, applicant, after the interviews, the companies rank the applicants, the students rank the companies, and we run a, uh, an optimization algorithm that allocates students to, to projects. And at that stage, at the end of January, the students know where they're going to be going the following June, so they have six months to organize to move to a different part of the country. And they're allocated their supervisors, so they know who their supervisors are going to be as well. And the companies can get ready to receive the students. And I would say that the process works very well. We have a little bit of nervousness and a little bit of uncertainty about projects, uh, and that's only natural. But by the time the students have settled into their projects, everybody is very happy with the project that they're undertaking. A company provides £45,000 to sponsor a student, £15,000 a year for three years. They provide workplace accommodation and day-to-day -day supervision. And that cash cost is one third of the cost of training a student. As I've said, they sit on our uh, student recruitment panels and sit on our industrial advisory body, and they also contribute guest lectures. So we're very proud of the activity that the sponsoring companies provide. Our students also have access to their facilities and assets, and some of them are quite significant. So the photograph on the left is the, is the full-scale 15-megawatt powertrain test rig uh, operated by the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and that's a full-size GE wind turbine being tested. And the photograph at the top is the Motion Energy Blue X machine on test at the European Marine Energy Centre's quarter-scale test site in, in Scapa Flow. And we've had students working directly on things to do with that project, on helping to get the machine into the water, uh, fitting components to it, and, and modifying things and testing equipment on it. So we're very, the students have very direct access. And if we look at some of the other project sponsors, we've had students working with Nova Innovations at the top left with their tidal turbine in Shetland. And we've got students working with Orbital, the Orbital O2 tidal turbine, which is under test at EMEC at the moment, two megawatt floating tidal turbine, generating power to the grid. And we've also had students working and continuing to work with sustainable marine energy and that's the Sustainable Marine Energy Platai, a floating platform uh, which has um, uh, small, far up to five or six tidal turbines mounted on it. The academic partnership of Edinburgh, Exeter, Strathclyde and SAMS was put together because each of the institutions has unique skills. Edinburgh University are experts in hydrodynamic model testing. Uh, we have a unique facility. We're experts in powertrain, and we're very good at resource assessment for tidal energy. The University of Exeter, uh, very good at wave energy resource assessment. They have an excellent mooring test facility and a tremendous capability in moorings and umbilicals and, and that kind of engineering. And uh, the University of Strathclyde is a department of naval architecture and maritime engineering, one of only a handful of departments in the UK that specialize in that area. Also very good at model testing very good at the fundamental ocean engineering side of things. None of us have any skills in marine biology, so the Scottish Association of Marine Sciences, the world's oldest marine biology research station, provide, provide that support for us and are incredibly valuable partners of this academic partnership. All of our projects are jointly supervised and as I've said, many of our courses are jointly taught. Students are supervised by three supervisors, one from each of the three universities, and that's part of the conditions of a joint award. But it's very powerful. So in some situations, the three supervisors will have completely different skills. I've been involved in projects where I've been advising the student on the aerodynamics of a wind turbine. Uh, and a supervisor from Strathclyde University has been advising on the hydrodynamics of the floating foundation and the supervisor for Exeter has been advising on the dynamics of the mooring system. And without all three areas being covered in sufficient detail, the student would have had problems. The student's got an industrial supervisor who's keeping them on track on a day-to-day -day basis. And every year, the student's progress is considered formally by an exam board, and the exam board monitors the student's progress through the programme. If things go horribly wrong, then as the centre director, I get involved. But normally... This is a very well 
oiled machine which, which provides very high quality outcomes for the student. Our students have access to world-class facilities at all three universities and also to the library facilities at all three universities and that's important because one of our students can get a copy of the aeronautical journal uh, because that's taken by Strathclyde University. I can't because Edinburgh University don't subscribe to it. So uh, students have, have a great range of access to different things through the three university libraries and they have access to world-class facilities. This is obviously Flowwave at the University of Edinburgh uh, which uh, which some of you will have, will have come across before, uh, but the students also have access to things like the DMAC, the top left, the um, Exeter University Dynamic Mooring Test Facility and Umbilical Test Facility, to the Kelvin Hydrodynamics Lab at, uh, in, in the bottom left at the University of Strathclyde, and shortly some of our students will be able to work at, uh, using the Fastblade facility uh, being built in Rosyth Dockyard by the University of Edinburgh. So these are unique facilities and students get involved in some unique projects as well. So this is some video of a uh, tidal measurement device, uh, convergent beam ADCP that's been developed by one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Brian Seller. The, there have been a number of NGD students working on the project uh, with Brian and working with the developers to understand the, the, the measurements that are obtained from such instrumentation. And this is it being installed at the Falls of Warness at the EMEC tidal site. It's a nine metre diameter machine, so it's, it's quite a big piece of kit for measuring the resource. We talk about the impact of ID Core and the papers that we've published and, and, and the results that have come out in a more academic way. So uh, currently we have 61 papers published on Scopus. Um, there are more that, that are not necessarily listed uh, on, on the scope of search, but that has 576 citations and an H index of 13, which is pretty credible for something that's been going for, for 10 years uh, in, in, as an academic program. Uh, we've also produced a special edition of Ocean Engineering, and I'm sure we will shortly be producing another special edition of a journal. You can see on this pie chart the range of topics that the papers that the students have published cover. Most are in engineering and energy, but there are papers in, in, in decision theory and computer science, in economics and econometrics, in environmental science. So students covering a, a range of different topics. We are very proud of the fact that we have a 100% employment record and that our students have created significant industrial impact. So ID calls a true partnership between academia and industry. Uh, we couldn't do this without the fantastic projects that, that industry provide and the strong supervision that comes from the academic team. Our students have been responsible for some amazing economic developments worth millions of pounds um, for saving £10 million in a, in a better optimization than the company was previously using for developing new tools which, which didn't exist and who have developed significant economic benefit for the companies. They produce high quality journal papers and they are highly employable. So as a, I, I think as a success, ID Core is, is beyond, beyond uh, many of the other centers of doctoral training in what it's achieving. And also, and this is important for an engineering program, uh, it's very, very broad in its intake. And so for the first time this year, we have seven female students and six male students uh, who, who were joining the program. And that's, that's the first time that we've ever had more women than men uh, on, on the programme. And for an engineering programme in the UK, that, that's quite an incredible position to be in. One of our students who's just about to graduate uh, said that he's gained much more all-round experience of how technology developers work and the political, financial and professional implications of working in industry than he could have imagined. And, and uh, he's fallen in love with project engineering and really wants to carry on working for a technology developer. And that's the kind of very strong testament that we're very proud of uh, from, uh, from our students. Equally proud of uh, are, is the comments of some of our project sponsors. Mark Lawless from JVA Consulting, who've, who've sponsored a number of student projects and employed even more of our graduates, uh, say that the level of commitment and technical caliber displayed by our research engineers is exceptional. 
and they couldn't have anticipated the contribution that ID Core would bring to the development of their services. Uh, and this is, is an amazing quotation uh, for us, and, and we're very, very proud of, of the view of industry and the view of the students of the programme. That's all I want to say about ID Core. I hope you found this uh, an interesting and informative uh, presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we will be happy to answer them. Arigato, Kwesamashita. So.